great. Brian, how are you, man? I don't get to see you enough. I'm doing great, Alan. How are you doing tonight? You're running. Hey, I'm doing great, man. You're running like um, a multinational, multi-district you know, operation with Synapse. It's pretty much, I don't know, it's pretty much year round for you, right? I mean, you, you put on the big event and then basically you got to get started on the next one. Now, by the way, you got very lucky with this whole coronavirus thing. You got very, very lucky. We were beyond fortunate and sometimes in business, just things like this happen and you get super lucky. But once we heard a couple of the events upcoming between Emerge Americas and South by Southwest started to get canceled um, and and then the push started to get into sports. um, I really thank lucky stars very often um, that we were able to get through our event because it is a big revenue driver for us. That's not the only thing we do, yeah. uh, but it's the biggest thing that we do over the course of a year. And it really brings the community together in a big way beyond right. just revenue. It's so important to get the community under one roof. You, you got so uh, lucky, man. You got so lucky. I was thinking about this the other day, like Synapse squeaked right in before this thing hit. It would have been, I'm going to say it, it would have been devastating for Synapse if, if you guys, right? Because the massive amount of money and investment that it took to fill the Emily Arena like you guys do every year, and you got Sarah Blakely, and you got, you got I don't know, what did you push 5,000 registered uh, members? Over 7,300, actually. It, it would have been beyond devastating. Um Maybe not as much for us because there's always ways to postpone and do things differently. Um, Of course, now we're looking out at in-person events in the future and what that means, but it would have been devastating for the community. And and that's the way that we think about this is what what does the innovation community need? What is it going to take to bring them together uh, across the state of Florida? And um, to not have something like this, a place where Sarah Blakely, a world-renowned, great, self-made billionaire entrepreneur can come in. Um, a, a place where they can learn, where they can navigate, where they can congregate, and, and truly the thought leaders of the state can come together. Um, it would have set us back years. No, I, I don't know how you would have. I mean, I just I feel very I'm very happy for you and for the whole Synapse organization because it's so important to the whole state of Florida that that conference happen. And so many, so many companies come together, so many people come together. And um, I just just shudder to imagine um, what would have happened if this the coronavirus would have would have appended that. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, okay, so you know what? We're going to get started. And um, I think that uh, I want to double check. I want to double check the uh, the Facebook Live and make sure that it's it, it's cranking here. Um, give me just give me uh, one second. I think we may have a lot of a few people. Oh. Okay, I've been given the signal that it is flowing into Facebook Live. That's all I needed to know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, um, all right. Good. So, here's the thing. Um, so, we, uh, I asked you for a little bit of walk-in music, and uh, I always ask my guests to give me their favorite slash relevant slash music that would be great walk-in. So, um, not that you're walking into the arena, but you, you kind of, you kind of are. And uh, here we go. Here we go. And by the way, I don't know. (laughs) Here we go. Hold on. (laughs) Is that that the high tech, uh, the high tech way of. That's the high tech way of doing it. Walking music. (laughs) So I got to ask. Why did you pick the danger zone when I sent this to you? Well, is that or the theme to curb your enthusiasm? Um, <laughs> no, uh, my background is in aerospace engineering, and there's a lot that comes from my background and things that I've mm-hmm. done. And so uh, that's that one right there from the University of Michigan. Um, yep. And love airplanes, have always loved airplanes since growing up. And Top Gun was a, a movie that when I was a kid uh, really hooked me into the airplane world and even in the innovation space even with what i'm doing now i still have a a big soft spot for that and for uh the things that i I love and a passion so um every time i get a chance it's uh either the theme to top gun highway to the danger zone number of songs you can go with from there can't go wrong so so here's the thing by the way we got a lot of folks that have shown up tonight and uh this is exciting so um 
And so I really appreciate everyone coming in. And what we're going to do is uh, the, the format of the show is that I interview you and we get a little bit of your background. Lean in a little bit just so I can get you close. And we we um, we get your background and so forth. But here's the key to the show. We really want to help folks. There's This is a really uh, tough economic time out there. Uh, I know you did a little bit of homework and, and prep for this. Um, and so we want to get your background and your story because you are a successful um quit to start entrepreneur like i can't wait to get into in terms of how you managed to quit two fortune 500 s p 500 companies to ultimately become an entrepreneur and ultimately too now you're enabling hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs in the in the entire not just tampa bay but the entire florida area with the synapse conference um so before we get started um i want to throw something together i threw this little uh presentation together. So so this is my opening slide, right? So, is this the danger zone or is it the freedom zone, right? So you you gave us the danger zone as the intro song. Barely. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but but or are we in the freedom zone, right? That's what we want to that's what we want to find out. And um so I think that uh uh basically I want to start first of all with our sponsor and um I'm going to actually throw something up here and let's see if everybody gets it yeah so we have a sponsor it's uh it's it's a startup company called secure startup it's actually uh, a platform that helps startups um, manage the documents that they work with to interact with investors right so startups that we work you and i are very familiar with brian which are startups that raise capital and by the way for those out there who understand there's there's two kinds of startups there's a startup that can be self-sustaining within a month or two which is great. And that's where basically, by the way, all the millionaires are created. You've created a real business that creates real revenues and real profits really fast. By the way, you got to, people got to tip your hat to that. All the millionaires I know, that's the kind of businesses they have, right? And so, but then there's this other kind of startup that's kind of a swing for the fences and you got to use other people's money, right? To, to do that. And people don't realize like as, as sexy and as romantic as it, as it gets on that side, um, you ultimately have a new boss. It's called your investor, right? But um, so we work, you and I work a lot with um, venture backed, high growth, scalable, um, kind of dent in the universe, change the world kind of startups. And they ultimately have to raise capital. They got to raise hundreds of thousands, if not definitely at some point millions of dollars. And there's not a really great platform for exchanging all these documents, term sheets and NDAs and all of the information that they end up sharing confidentially with these investors that are very proprietary trade secret secrets, right? So Secure Startup is the platform. It's a Tampa Bay based uh, uh, company that actually helps in that whole exchange of documents and really controls, you know, whose eyes only that gets to see those. And it's a really, it's a really great uh, platform. And we have it's a mutual friend of ours in the Tampa Bay area that actually has built this and is implementing this. So that's our sponsor. And I've got a little thing across the top. Um, so first of all, a little bit about me, and I, I'm going to shorten this every every podcast shorter and shorter, right? I teach entrepreneurship at the University of South Florida. I bring in guest speakers, real founders uh, every week. Brian, you've been a speaker, I think, last year yeah. um, at UT Entrepreneurship. I'm an entrepreneur residence. I work with a lot of students there on their startup ideas and try to inspire. Um, Tampa Bay Wave is our number one largest tech uh, uh, startup accelerator, and I'm a co-founder there for the last 12 years working with uh, dozens and dozens of startup founders there helping them move along. I had investor relations with that organization. My career has been half corporate, half entrepreneur. So I feel like I can really relate someone who I kind of rose the ranks of, of, of cubicle, my cubicle job raised to my middle management job, raised to my director job, raised to my C-suite job. Right. And so, um, and I really, I wrote a whole book called um, quit to start, which we will, um, plug uh, a little better than this, but this is ultimately a book about why corporate working for other people, if you have an entrepreneurial mindset, is not uh, is ultimately not a game that you win, right? If you have an entrepreneurial mindset, and that's uh, basically what my life has been, where I had to break away from that corporate environment because ultimately it wasn't going to get me not only where I wanted to go, you know, financially and freedom, but ultimately just you just mental and self-actualization and fulfillment was never going to happen there. And I found out the hard way. It took me till my early 40s before, you know, I kind of experimented in and out of it before I realized that it really wasn't going to get me where I wanted to go. So the book I mentioned, dedicated to others uh, in planning their start. 
And this, this webcast is raw and unrehearsed, right? So a little bit just as a, a starting point, right? So I just like to throw this slide up and I throw it up every week and I'm going to make it faster and faster, but there's a lot, we're get, we're going into a really, really tough economic situation. It's worse than I think most people realize. Um, I think people are starting to understand the gravity of this situation with the, the layoffs and the loss of jobs and furloughs. Um, but it's worth knowing, and we're most for sure, we're probably heading into a recession, which was probably coming anyway, but this definitely was gas on the fire. Um, but it's worth noting how many great companies that we use today and that are household brands were started in a recession, whether we're talking, and, and by the way, you know, Brian, you know, this is from a, you know, from an economics perspective, we enter a recession about every 10 to 12 years, plus or right. minus in this country, right? It's just a cycle that's been going on for, for nearly a hundred years. So, so these companies span a lot of generations, but ultimately some of the best companies in the world get started in downturns, right? So you need to kind of understand that there's opportunity in this and it and is as painful as it is, it can actually stimulate the most, the best creativity that mankind or womankind has to offer in these, in these trying times, both personally, but also in the market, when the market's struggling, it, 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 it mother of invention, right? Necessity, but also personally, it spawns tremendous creativity, right? Which is the next piece of this started with very little money, Right. These are companies that started with little to no money. These are all household brand names. And uh, and so it's just kind of worth reminding everybody. So as tough as it is today, if you're still in your job and you and, and you have an opportunity to maybe work in, on a startup idea or a plan, take advantage of that opportunity while you have that job to maybe make plans to create maybe the next great company or maybe just something like a really great solopreneur or homepreneur or something just something that just uh, serves the market that you've carved out. And like I said, all the millionaires I know, no one's ever heard of. Brian, you feel me on that, right? All uh, the millionaires I know, no one's ever heard of, right? And you know the same ones I know. Every city has got like dozens and dozens and dozens of millionaires that no one has heard of because they run just really great businesses in the, in the, in the niches and crevices of the market, right? Yep, so find that, find that opportunity and uh, fill the gap. Correct. Correct. And it can be local, regional, or it can be, it can be big like these examples I have here. So the situation right now, um, you know, I talk about this, about, you know, digging your well before you're thirsty. Uh, survivorpreneurship is something that either you're being forced into or something you should be strongly considering. Um, and I also ask, you know, hey, if you don't have an entrepreneurial an entrepreneurial bone in your body, you'd be surprised how many un successful entrepreneurs that we know, Brian, that fundamentally aren't really necessarily on their, on its surface as aren't wired to be entrepreneurs, but they out of necessity or just out of just wanting to create a better life for themselves, selves made themselves into an entrepreneur. And I, and, and you and I have mutual friends about that. We know some people yep. that are just not on the surface entrepreneurs, right? But they're now they're independently wealthy having built and sold companies that really they would have been the least likely that you would have imagined or, or predicted would have done that, right? It can be done clinically. It can be done analytically. You don't have to be the most charismatic, uh, you know, gift of gab and, 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 and kind of, uh, kind of compelling person. You, anybody can actually do it if it's, if it's in their, um, if it's in their will and in their drive to be so, right? Yep. So the last thing I've read there is job security. Hmm. Okay. You're going to talk about this, Brian, but for sure. But, um, you know, is job security really a thing? I often like to say that, uh, you know, people talk about startups being risky. Guess what? Working for somebody else is risky. Working for corporate is risky. And I said this six to eight months ago. I've been saying this for years, but uh, now it's, you know, something people can easily put their head around because of all the job losses and all the fear of job losses. Right. But it's always been true. So, so job security is really a thing. If you really, if you have it in you, if you have the muster to do this, the only way to really get the kind of job security that you imagine slash fulfillment slash freedom and wealth, entrepreneurship is kind of the only thing that delivers. Now, tremendous risk, tremendous risk, tremendous risk, right? But if you pull it off, like so many have, and not just creating something amazingly big that makes a poster, but just even creating something in your community, in your world, um, then uh, it's, uh, it's definitely something that um, can produce for you, right? So those are kind of my opening slides, Brian. And, uh, and we get into yours in a minute. But before we do, I want to see if anybody uh, out there, before we get into Brian and your story, 
I want to see if anybody out there wants to throw out a, cause we do this live and we've got a few dozen, we've got, we've got a good number of people out there. Anybody that wants to throw out a comment or a question, anybody wants to amen or second any of the points that I just made, um, just hit, hit me up on the, uh, on the chat and just say, Hey, I want to, I want to, um, I want to add something right here. Just type that into the chat message and I have the ability to turn on your microphone or your video, whichever you prefer, and just let me know. Okay, cool. Cal wants to add something. And Cal. Um, hey, Cal. Yeah. Do you know Cal? Cool. Uh, everybody knows Cal. <laughs> All right, Cal. I'm unlocking your microphone, Cal, and it'll just take about, I don't know, five, 10 second delay. Um, and so you should be good for now. Give it a shot. One more second, Cal. All right, Cal, hang in there. You should be you should be live. Your microphone is unlocked, and uh, you can speak, Cal. Give it a run. All right, Cal. We're, we're not getting you. I got you green lit over here, but maybe you're not coming in. Um, anybody else want to give it a shot? Um, anybody else want to give it a shot? Okay. If not, let's uh, let's get back into it. So. So Brian, um, University of Michigan Aerospace Engineering, University of Florida Aerospace Engineering, um, University of South Florida MBA, which was what brought you back to Tampa, and um, then Northrop Grumman. What I want to focus on here, Brian, is really what you and I have talked about before. Your frustration when you got in, when you got out of college, and you had to when you were working for these large companies, ultimately Northrop Grumman and then Nielsen. You, you did a great job last time we spoke talking about just how it was not a fit for you with, with your mindset. So maybe maybe walk me through that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I started my career with Northrop Grumman in 2007, which a uh, really good time, really great opportunity to be in the defense world right in 2007. And then the 2008 election came along and then the, uh, um, the recession hit and uh, things in the defense field started to go down. So as we were talking about job security, um, I, I had one of those meetings at one point that said, hey, look, like your our project's getting scaled back. You need to you have two weeks to find a new job in the company. And by the way, this company is not really hiring very much right now. So oh, crap. Like and you learn very quickly. Job security can be a myth. Um, you know, young 24, 25 year old coming out of grad school, great education and, and being told, by the way, you're not valuable here anymore. Um, and was able to, to maneuver around Northrop for a little bit. But really starting to see, um, seeing the way people act and seeing that people were there and the people who were moving up were the ones who wanted to stand on a chair and say, oh, my God, look at me. I, I did some great things, not the ones who actually did great things. Um, mm -hmm. There's a great quote that I love. It's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. There's a lot of people who cared about the credit and they didn't care about the accomplishments. Um, so fast forward to about 2013 when I started working with Nielsen. Um, it was 2013, yeah, 2013. Um, and it, within about two weeks, uh, quickly discovered the company and great company. They've served a need for a very long period of time, but the culture was very much of a top down. If I'm your boss and I say what I say goes, and if it goes wrong, even if you told me the right thing, I'm going to blame you because I can. And that's what you do. It was just everything rolls down the hill, rolls down the hill. And I never wanted to play that game. I never wanted to be that person. And people thought I was crazy because I would stand up in a meeting and say, oh, yeah, that was my fault. Sorry. What do you mean that was your fault? Aren't you, you might get fired. Sorry. Uh, there's something we can do about this. There's ways we can improve. There's ways that we can do things better. Um, and it just it never resonated with me. Somebody actually once told me the culture uh, went by what's called a hippo culture, standing for highest paid person's opinion, all that mattered. And I'm never going to be that way. I'm not wired that way. I'm wired to challenge. I'm wired to think. I'm wired to, to push an envelope, to say, mm -hmm. all right, we've done it this way for this long. Why? Why can't we do things a little bit better? Why, if we're repeating something, where can we save money? Where can we do better on the top line, the bottom line? Not because I was trying to get a bonus or pad my bank account, because that's what I want to do. And even in projects that I didn't like, I always wanted to do a good job. And a lot of people would just want to do an average job, skate by, not get noticed for the bad things and take credit for everybody else's accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who would get promoted. And so I started very quickly looking at uh, an exit strategy and starting to think about what was out there, what opportunities and always having a, a number 
uh, a list in my phone of different potential companies to start. Finally, um, around the 2013, 2014 timeframe said this, that's it. I, I just have to get down into this. I have to start something new. Um, this is my turn. It's my time to really step out on a limb and uh, try something else. Um, starting it as a side hustle, starting it as something on the side of Nielsen. But I knew that um, I, I was not going to be long for that company. And my job security there was probably minimal because I, for lack of a better term, didn't care to comply with the way that they wanted to do things. Correct. And so, and so this is, is this when, this is when the popcorn, is this when popcorn apps kind of started bubbling up? So tell us about that. So this is when you made your big, so you left, did you leave Nielsen? Like you just, you just had to leave Nielsen, which both those of you don't know Nielsen, this is the Nielsen ratings company. Uh, this is definitely uh, one, uh, one of the larger companies in the world. They're based in the Tampa Bay area. And, um, and you I, just, after Northrop Grumman and Nielsen, you just couldn't stomach the, the, the bureaucracy and the culture and the politics any longer. And uh, so how did popcorn apps come to be? So popcorn apps actually was company number two. Um, and, and company number mm -hmm. one, as you were talking in the beginning about the swinging for the fences versus um, hitting mm -hmm. some singles, um, company number one was swinging for the fences. Um, it, it absolutely wasn't. I had no clue what I was doing. I had no clue about execution. I had no clue about how to build a team. I had no clue a uh, good UX or anything. I just knew I could put something together and ha had a decent idea. Still think it's a good idea. Still think it's a potential home run idea somewhere or another because no one's been able to pull it off very well. Mm -hmm. um, and it went up in flames miserably. And it's amazing. And I love talking about it because I learned so much from those few months of getting started or that year of really getting started in the first concept and the first idea and um, really learn how and to do things in building a business and not just trying to do something because it's a fun idea, but how to solve a problem and how to build off of weaknesses and how to build, play off of strengths. And one of the strengths that I saw, um, I built this app um, alongside a team that was a mix of an onshore offshore development team. And um, I was getting quotes in the early stages of it and that people told me it was gonna cost me uh, about $150,000 to build and ended up getting it built for about 12,000. Um, so I said at the time, oh, well, that's an interesting business model. I could really be a project manager for people and a consultant for people and help them build their apps and get their ideas out to market. More than just a uh, um, just an app developer, but it was really a whole, you have an going from concept to ready for release product, go to market strategy, building a team, getting the right people in place, getting that playbook together. If you needed sales, how do you help build sales in an organization? If you needed advertisement, how do you start getting outbound there? Um, and, and so that was something that I said, oh, that's, uh, I could really start to do this and start to build little profits or decent sized profits off of each development and really make some good money for my time. And so that's where Popcorn Apps truly came from was that launch and that concept of, oh, I did it this way. There's other people asking me, how did, how did you get this built so quickly? How did you get this built so inexpensively? Because at the time, I'm not sitting there with $150,000 that I want to throw into an idea and hope that it worked. I, I was hoping that someone would come invest and someone would come throw me a handful of a wad of cash of $500,000, which is a really good thing that nobody ever did because that would have been a giant waste of $500,000 at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to admit that now. Um, and, able to actually solve a problem for other people and actually able to start making up that money. And as I was saying, it was hitting singles. It wasn't swinging for the fences, but it was hitting single after single. And it was something that was very repeatable and buildable. Got it. So, so you were, so you were basically mastered this idea of building apps and this is probably mo mostly mobile apps at the time, right? Yeah. And, it, uh, big mobile app boom. Yeah. And you had a team and you, you had all the beats worked out. So you knew how to get from zero to 10. And, uh, and what about the, um, and, and so were you, most of your clients word of mouth, I would guess at that point? Yeah, I, I did a little bit of marketing, a little bit of advertising, did a couple of trade shows, did some radio work. Um, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of word of mouth that would come together, joined a networking group, 
Um, yeah. and, and that's the way a lot of this market was working, um, especially in 2014, 2015. It was yeah. a very word of mouth market and a very, you have to know the person that knows the person to yeah. be able to get something together. There was no central location. There was no place to go. While Tampa Bay Wave was up and growing and building, um, it still was a, a very niche at a certain point. Um, mm -hmm. There was nothing. I There were people down the street from me who mm -hmm. uh, were doing very similar things who I should have gotten in touch with that I could never get in touch with. I finally, yeah. I ended up meeting um, Greg Ross Monroe from Source Toad sometime yeah, yeah. in 2016. I need, and to, get, was, I need to get him on this. I need to get him on this yeah, show. You, you really do. I love Greg. Um, yeah. He um, he and I sat down. We started to having a chat, and he talked about how he was really pivoting and going into the cruise ship industry and building uh, software for cruise ships. But people were st still coming to him with ideas that were right in my price range over the course of a year or so. And he looked at me and said, wow, I, I don't know where you've been this last year. I could have made you a couple hundred thousand dollars just mm -hmm. over this. And that's when I, I perked my head up and said, there's a problem here just in connectivity of this region and, and the right arm and the left arm not working well together and not talking to each other. Yeah. So, so, so at this point you're, you're kind of, um, working in obscurity in my opinion, like if people bear, know you don't know you, whatever, this is yeah, all, pre, this is, <laughs> this is all, pre, this is all pre fame, right? This is all pre fame because now you're the Brian Kornfeld that the world, the nose, especially in Florida, from coast to coast, and from from the Panhandle to the to the um, at, South Florida. At least, at least twelve people. <laughs> yeah. So you you've uh, you quite um, there was a massive turning point for you, and so. <laughs> but let's level set to this for people that are out there that could maybe use some advice in what they're doing. What you're, the story you're about to tell in terms of how your destiny changed dramatically. Set the stage about what the mindset was and how, like, how that came to be. Because, um, you know, you were doing a lot of things that there's a lot of hustle and a lot of turning over rocks and kissing frogs that you were doing up to this point before this big turn came, right? So I'd love you to speak a little bit because I think it could be inspirational to people out there listening, right? Yeah. Um, one thing that I, I always like to tell people, entrepreneurship, you, people see, mm -hmm. oh, my God, this person's an entrepreneur. They're going to be a multimillionaire. They're going to be a billionaire. They're going to work for themselves. They're going to take three week long vacations. And, and that's just a myth. That's not reality. You might see people who do that later on in their careers after they've built something up. But entrepreneurship's hard. This is a really hard lifestyle. Um, and there's a quote in a league of their own towards the end, Tom Hanks is talking to Gina Davis and she says to him, it got hard. And he said, it's supposed to be hard. And the ones who go through the hard is why you make it great. And so it's the people who are willing to plow through these hard times that really come out on the other side. And, and um, I was doing that hustle and very much behind the scenes and just talking to people and networking and going out all the time and driving my wife crazy and trying to uh, understand the different landscapes, the different players, trying to understand who were the right people to talk to, who were the people that were not, that, you know, it, it might have not really been worth the time. Mm -hmm. But in order to be able to build up that network and be able to help people out and be able to try to say, how can I help you out? So knowing one day down the road, if I needed something, there might be a question that's out there. Never really needing anything at the time, just trying to understand and also trying to learn what other problems are out there and what opportunities are out there? So you, again, you're turning over a lot of rocks, kissing a lot of frogs. You, you weren't, and, and let's be honest, you were looking for your next project, right? You were looking for your next project and, you know, you know, out there. I, I don't know if I was looking for the next project. I was more looking on how to take popcorn apps to the next level. That's what I mean. Like uh, you were looking yeah. for your next paid engagement for popcorn yep. apps. And that's what I meant mm -hmm. by that. Yeah, and, next customers, next right. thing. thing this is, again, this is pre-fame Brian Kornfeld. So you, and then one day you stumbled into somebody. Yeah. So, about, yeah. So, at, and at the time I still was working with Nielsen. This was making me some money and it was doing all right, but it wasn't um, mm -hmm. paying wife. Whoa, kid. whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're talking side hustle right now. 
Yeah. Oh, well, this is side hustle. At, yeah, it was side hustle. Full on. Okay. Side so hustle. we've got to we've got to really emphasize that right now because yeah. a lot of folks out there need to be thinking about side hustle in their corporate jobs that they may or may not have in in two, three, four, six months from now. Right. Yeah. Um, they need to be thinking. So let's step back a second. And yeah. the, the whole context of everything you talked about, you were doing most of everything you said. Um, nights, completely weekends, on, yeah, completely on the side. Nights, weekends, staying up till twelve o'clock, one in the morning, two in the morning. Waking up early, doing things Saturday, Sunday. Um, networking events from five to eight o'clock at night. Uh, couldn't go to anything and everything that I wanted to, but trying and, and just seeing what came out. It, it's I always knew if I didn't try, I'd be in the same spot. And, and that to me was a, a really telling moment once that it, once that fact hit me, uh, I could do this or I could not. And the worst thing that's going to happen is I'm going to be in the exact same position. And that to me um, said, keep going and keep trying, because if I give up, then, you know, I, I know the way the life is going to go. Yeah, I might move up. I might move a, a career. I might move to another company, get a ten thousand dollar raise, maybe get a nice title. Maybe one day I'll get an office where I could hang a picture. And that would be about it. Right. And so I, I see Ronald. We got Ronald Davis. Uh, he says he knows the feeling. <laughs> a lot of us do. Yeah, a lot right. Of nervous feeling. Right. So you were so the good the big the big takeaway here is see this place that you're at now, you're at this very leveled up place. You're the envy of a lot of people I know, and I mean that all and, and I'll do honesty and respect. Like you you pulled off something really big with synapse. And you probably sometimes have to pinch yourself and wonder how you pulled it off. I know anything in life that you pull off, all it's funny because you you sl you, you kind of grind and bleed and sweat and you try to and you're fighting hard and you're clawing and 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 you have to do all that to get an opportunity, right? An opportunity, uh, really a cherry a cherry opportunity uh, only comes to those that are just grinding and fighting and scrapping and scratching, right? You know this, you know this, right? And it's something. Also, it's not always the opportunity that you think presents itself. Sometimes it's a side opportunity to the, what the opportunity you think is in front of you. Right. So it's always being aware of your surroundings and, and being very present and knowing. A lot of people will say to me, like, why aren't you paying attention? And I'm paying attention in conversations, but I'm always very aware of what's going on um, around within an organization, outside an organization, what's going on on a macro level, what's taking place in the economy. Uh, the more that you know and the more knowledge you have and things like this, the more power that you have. It's like when you tell them the first rule of a negotiation is be the most prepared person in the negotiation. And if you're the most prepared person, I'm sure uh, Dan Heckman will uh, uh, slap my hand for uh, giving away tips and tricks of a salesperson there. Um, <laughs> it, uh, um, it, if you're more prepared, you're one step ahead of everybody else in there who's just going to listen. But then, you know, then, and then, and then play it off like you're not prepared, by the way. Yeah. Well, you have to have that. Right. That <laughs> yeah. Be really prepared and then play it off like you're not prepared and you've got the best of both worlds. It's pretty cool. Um, and Dan, by the way, don't think you can get away with this show not voicing in. So I need to see you. By the way, there's a little icon in the lower right hand corner with the hand raise. So if you, if you hit that, I know that you want to weigh in and, and either type something or I can mic you in with a live mic. And, well, on um, cue, Dan raises his hand. Yeah, on cue. Does he do it? Yeah, there we go. In fact, Dan, I, just to keep this fun, um, we are going to turn your mic on right now. Usually there's like a five to 10 second lag. I would turn your mic on, but I don't think you're, you're dressed for success probably right about now. Um, I do have the, we can turn on your camera if we, if you want to, but go ahead, Dan, if you, if you can hear us. That's up to you guys. If you want to, uh, to, to actually <laughs> hey, see me, is that a, is that a challenge? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm dressed. <laughs> okay. I'm, here, I'm clean, here it comes. I'm clean shaving. Here, here, here it comes. The camera's been, the camera's been unlocked. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> if, if I hadn't seen Dan on a previous web webinar, like two hours ago, I probably would have, uh, <laughs> let's, let's face it even a clean haircut doesn't fix ugly <laughs> hey wait a minute dan where's that beard man i like the beard i was in love with the beard i know uh two days ago i was sitting in the in the other room and I, i've only had a beard twice in my life the first time i was like 25 and the last one was a couple of weeks ago it drives me nuts it got it's itchy and it, yeah. i just i finally just i couldn't do it 
So Dan, what do you got? What do you want to weigh in here? What do you want to amen, brother, on? No, so so the the whole prep for selling and the way you want to do it, it it's and Arnold did say this too. I'm an over preparer. I over prepare. It's not trickery. There's no uh, you know science magic behind it all. It's really just and, and Brian kind of does this and so do I through Synapse in my own company, but you're just solving problems for customers, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever those clients are. And, and by the way, with the new abnormal, as Mark Cuban now calls it, the new abnormal is going to change the way that we look at, at businesses moving forward and the way that we approach our customers. Synapse 2021, that event will be dramatically different than what it is today. As a matter of fact, how we monetize the assets within Synapse and what you know Brian and team is doing is going to be very different this year and probably for years to come, right? How do we monetize this type of environment? How do we educate people differently? How do they, I mean, customers are so much more educated than they've ever been in the past. And so I, I think really digging into that, I'm gonna over prepare and, and by the way, I'm still going to ask intelligent questions. I'm still yeah. going to make sure that the customer is always in charge of what it is that you're doing. Um, yeah. So that's, that's yeah. spot on, Brian. Yeah. That's awesome. And, uh, and that's more than just selling too. That's life. Yeah. But, I mean, that's for anything and everything because I'm only selling a small part of my time. It, it's always being ready for a conversation. Oh, you never know who you're going to run into or bump into, have something to say and mm -hmm. selling. Um, you're always selling yourself and selling yourself or selling a business. Even if you're not actually selling something, you're selling the trust factor in you when you go out and you meet someone and whether or not you shake their hand or you're networking for the first time, you're selling the fact that you're worthwhile. There it is. Exactly. Uh <laughs> All right. Hey, so Dan, Dan, you're officially, uh, thank you for stepping in sure. and uh, we appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and get back to Brian. So, so that was awesome. You got a fan there and Dan, you know, that's not fair. You're stacking the cards like that. Um, but, but Brian, talk about the big moment, man. So you're out there hustling, scrapping and scraping and you're dealing with these and all of a sudden you, you meet, you meet someone that changed yeah. everything. So, um, the day is very easy for me to remember, April 1st, because it was April Fool's Day, and it's not an April Fool's Day joke, of 2016. Um, I, uh, um, as a graduate of the executive MBA program at USF, they have a guest speaker the first Friday of every month. And April 1st, 2016, the guest speaker happened to be some gentleman named Jeff Finnick. Um, being a, a lifelong Tampa Bay native, I've been going to Lightning Games since 1992. He was starting to really build up this concept of uh, – what was then, I don't know if it was Water Street 2020, but still they was talking about the real estate development being done by this year. Um, and I just wanted to hear about that, the future of Tampa. Maybe he'd talk about the lightning and coming off the Stanley Cup run from the year before. And the last 20 minutes, he started talking about this concept of an innovation hub. And it was the first time people had really heard him start to say, I wanna build an innovation hub. I think that's something that would be a game changer here. So there was a couple of things that I could have done at that point in time. I could have just taken notes and walked out and been like, oh, my God, cool. He's going to build an innovation hub. Um, I could have done absolutely nothing. I could have. Uh, um, but as an alum, when all the students went back to class, there was about four of us there. And I uh, went up and just wanted to introduce myself, say thank you very much for everything you've done. I remember the days when the lightning were terrible before you bought them. Uh, really appreciate what you're doing. And by the way, I'm in the innovation space. Um, I'm doing this, I'm building apps for people and I'd love to find a way to help you out with this innovation hub. He said, hey, great. Quick, quick, quick time out. Give everybody a little quick, for those who haven't heard of Jeff Vinnick, just a quick thumbnail on like this uh, guy's background. So Jeff Vinnick is currently the owner of the Tampa Bay Lightning, Vinnick Sports Group, the person who envisioned all the Water Street Tampa downtown, uh, $3 billion real estate development with Bill Gates. Uh, he's a venture capitalist. He has a family office where he's investing in a lot of uh, companies, a lot of growth stage companies. And his background is in uh, hedge fund management. So he had his own fund. Um, he worked. He managed uh, Fidelity Magellan for a, a long period of time as well. And so he has built a lot and he bought the Lightning in, I believe, 2010. Um, and so it's been 10 years now since he has been here. Um, and it's been a, a big growth 
that's happened in downtown based on the opportunities that he has seen. He has probably single-handedly changed the landscape of Tampa and Tampa Bay more than anyone since Jose Gaspar. Okay, good. So that's the guy you walked up to and started yeah. like, you know, having a conversation unsolicited, like and on your said, own. I, I'd love to find a way to help. And that was it. Gave a, a quick little pitch, 10, 15 seconds, unre completely unrehearsed, completely off the cuff. Um, and said, I'd love to find a way to help. He gave me his card. Um, I gave him mine. Um, then I, I said, all right, what's the next step to myself? Got home, decided I was going to wait three days to email him, do the thing like when you meet a girl at a bar and you don't want to call for three days and you don't want to feel anxious. So I waited three days, sent him an email, oh, nice, typed out, uh, two paragraphs, just said, love to find a way to meet and uh, give you some of my ideas. And within an hour, I had a response. I half expected a response from a staffer. I half expected a response that just was like, thanks, I got a lot of people working on this already. And I half expected a re no response. There's this much in me, like this very little much in me that said he was gonna come back and say with anything that said, let's sit down and meet. And that's what came, Was that was it. One line, my assistant's on copy, she'll set up a meeting for us. Really, a meeting, wow. That was it. I'm like, all right, well, crap. meeting now a meeting with a billionaire, a meeting with a billionaire because you had the guts to walk up to him and and then be short and sweet, by the way, too. Yeah. So short you don't so you don't so you don't spook him and like who's this weirdo, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I actually I had the pleasure of uh, interviewing him at the summit this year, doing a fireside chat where I got to interview him, and somebody asked about taking meetings, and he said he on average says yes to about one out of every twenty people who ask him. And that on stage, I almost broke out in tears. Like, oh my God, I easily could have fallen into the 95%. I still don't know what made me stand out comparatively, but something that was said, some type of preparation, something that was ready to go. And I just knew I needed to find a way to help. And um, I, that was I probably, in my mind, at least the big thing was I was not asking for anything from me. I was asking how I can help him. And yeah. so... Then I had to actually learn and prepare. And uh, part of it was how do we build a thriving innovation ecosystem around the Tampa Bay area? And I had to come up with ideas and come up with concepts and something that was going to stand out and something that was going to be new. Um, and, and had that meeting about a, six weeks later um, when we finally had the opportunity to sit down and it went pretty well. Um, he still, even for a long period of time, I was watching him on TV, talking, using quotes of stuff that I said in that meeting. But it wasn't that meeting, it was the next one that actually was the even bigger changer because um, at the 4th, I went to a 4th of July party with a friend from summer camp and his father-in-law, um, father-in-law's house, nice house, had done pretty well for himself, could tell he was one of those millionaires, um, started talking over a barbecue and he was talking about how he's doing some research from the venture capitalist perspective on how do you build an innovation ecosystem here in Tampa Bay and why it's so inefficient. And I said, that's funny. I'm doing the exact same research from the entrepreneurship side. And that's how Mark Blumenthal and I met. And we just started talking over a couple of drinks and set a meeting. And quickly, a 30-minute meeting turned into two hours on a whiteboard where we started to frame out what the future of Tampa Bay and the future of really the state of Florida and innovation and this entire community coming together could look like. Got it. So that's that was the – so Vinick led you to Blumenthal, led you to – uh, partnering up on this project, right? Well, and, and as I um, found out later, the two of them were talking in the background and both had the, and they had the conversation of, oh, have you talked to this person? And, and yes, have you talked to this person? Yes. And so it was kind of this triangle that came together. And while Jeff is not directly involved with Synapse, um, he does, there's certain things he does. He speaks at the summit every year. He's always a big proponent of what we do. Um, we're big proponents of Embark Collective, what ended up getting built. We've actually moved our offices into Embark Collective. Can't wait to get back into Embark Collective once uh, everything reopens again. Um, and, and it's amazing what he built and what they built, what Lakshmi Shinoy and her team at Embark has built. I'm really proud of what they've put together. Um, so Jeff has been really focused there. And while we're focused in on building this uh, virtual community and this community based on uh, the large scale event. Yeah. So, you know, I want to pause, right? That This is where I want to kind of insert. And I want to encourage it, folks who are listening to kind of think about what weighing in here, because now I want to transition a little bit into helping other people. 
And and I think that, you know, you went on to build this amazing success with Synapse and this huge conference. There's not a lot you can it's really great to hear about, but but I love I love focusing on the struggle years, right? The struggle periods, because that's really what people should be able to relate to that ultimately helps them fight on and live on and try to create something big um, or create something for themselves. So, you know, you were up to, that's why I like stopping this story here. All right. So um, that's a great kind of transition into what advice would you give someone who is either okay, we've talked about in a job, side hustle, but even someone who's already actually out there trying to do the solopreneurship, trying to find clients and projects like you were with Popcorn, who is you know, trying to create a home-based solopreneur business or maybe even create a company, but you know, is struggling to do that either semi-full-time or full-time. It's just a big struggle, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and give away the, the game on this. You the key it seems like to me is that you just got out there and massively you went networked. You went to like so many things. You connected with so many people. You wouldn't, you weren't taking no for an answer. You were in people's faces. You were just out. You were just like, you were maniacal. That's, that's my take on one of the, your key success factors. That, that that's definitely one of them that uh, I did and was able to do well. I'm um, an engineer by background and can think like an engineer, but also can have uh, the conversation, the outbound conversation, more extroverted than introverted than the traditional engineer. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'm always looking at too is problem solving and, and how I can help. And so the best businesses are those that really stem from solving a problem. And I always look at people and when people are telling me their concepts or their ideas, I always love to ask, what problem are you solving? Who are you solving it for? And are they gonna be willing to pay for it? Um, one of the best stories that I've heard of a business getting launched was from one of our keynotes this past year, um, Jeff Hoffman, who in, he was one of the founders of Priceline.com. But before that, he actually invented kiosks at airports where you print out your boarding pass. And he did that because he waited one time online for two hours to get a boarding pass and to check in for a flight. And he turned around when he got to the front of the line and said, how much will anybody pay me to cut me in line? And when people were um, offering him hundreds of dollars, he said, I'm on to something here. There, there's got to be a faster and a better way to do this. And that pushed him right into that entrepreneurship realm. So look at the problem and, and see, is there something that people are willing to pay for? And if you can really think about it in that way, then you can start to gear something that you're building for a customer and not try to do something too much. You can hit that first single. You can start to get customers. You can start to show some, show some traction. And right now, especially in this world, that's one of the most important things you can do, and especially in the next couple of months when the world starts to get back to business a little bit and companies start spending some money. That's one of the best things that you can do is show that traction. So then when it's time to build and scale and if you do want to swing for the fences and go for the venture backed money, you are showing um, a path to success already. You're showing a path to scale. You're not starting all the way from scratch where you're saying, well, I'm hoping this will work. You can show to someone this will work. Right. Brian, that's awesome. We have a question here from Chad. So Chad says, so, so how much of your ability to latch on do you attribute uh, to right time, right place versus being intentional? Um, it almost sounds like having a plan is the anti-pattern to entrepreneurship. Um, there's some to, to right place, right time for sure. It's a great question, uh, for, by the way, right? Yeah, th this is a very good question. Um, there, there's something to be said for serendipity, and there's never going to be a 100%. Uh, one of the things that I've done a lot in my background before this is to play poker. Actually, if uh, you were to ever Google Brian Kornfeld poker, you'd find pictures of me from the World Series of Poker in 2006, uh, which is uh, and back, back in the day. That was my three seconds of fame. Uh, back in the day, it was Brian. Amazing. How did I forget to put this in our promo piece? I could have had, I could have doubled the attendance on this. Wow, I feel next like time. I'm, next, yeah, next, next time. time. Um, but and poker, people will look at it in two different ways. Some see it as gambling, which is a, a luck game, and some see it as a, a skill game. Really, it's a mix of both. And you're going to put the odds, and the odds you can gamble at points and have a forty percent chance of winning something. You can even put the odds in your favor and have a 60% chance or 70% chance of winning something, but you still have a 30% chance of losing and it not going well. 
I think of uh, this world in the same way is if you go out and you just try to throw things at everything and see what happens, then you might have a 5% chance of being successful anytime that you do it. Mm -hmm. And it really a, a sense of volume. If you are intentional, you might have a 60, 70% chance of having success with a connection. And that's what makes a, a difference is when you start to do that, two, three, four of them will then start to really build up for you. So it's not ever going to be a 100% thing, but it's all about just putting the odds in your favor. And that's why being at least a little bit intentional will make a difference. Yeah, I want to put it, I want to put a twist on that because it's often being intentional is what gets you into the game and gets you in position for the serendipity, right? Mm -hmm. Like the like you were being intentional about popcorn apps and all that you were doing and all that, but because you were so intentional and in all of that, it opened it like led you to the place that you were able to see the serendipitous opportunity that actually ended up giving you the opportunity to do something different. So for sure, being random is not effective, right? Um, right being intentional is effective and either your plan a the thing that you're being intentional about is going to is going to actually play out to be um hold on one second let me make sure i've got this okay cool either your um either the thing that you're being intentional about is going to play out just as you might imagine or you being intentional is going to open some new doors but but one thing for sure not being intentional and being random doesn't open many doors at all yeah. And that's the thing. You got to try. You, you got to put yeah. yourself out there and you got to take those opportunities because you're um, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take to not to use a, that cliche. I think I've used enough of them already. Cliches and quotes. Um, <laughs> but, but it's true. And if you don't even give yourself a chance, even if it's a one percent, a five percent chance, then you have a zero percent chance of doing it. And you're just going to be the same thing over and over. And as I said earlier, think about what's the worst that can happen. Put yourself out there. You might spend an hour at a networking event. You might spend an hour going out to dinner, having a drink, or having a cup of coffee with someone. Um, you know, back when we get out of the abnormal and back into the renormal, and or maybe it's an hour on a webinar, maybe an hour on a phone call nowadays, um, utilizing right. some of the different networking opportunities that are out there now. Um, it, it's giving yourself a chance for success versus giving yourself a zero percent chance for success. Yeah, I, I was going to add to that that um, that's it's it's absolutely being in the game. So I had some other questions that I kind of pre prepared for you, and right. uh, and uh, so I want to jump into some of those real quick. Um, so um, let me reopen, and uh, basically we want to give some some advice and some information that we want to share with people that could be useful right now. And I've opened the door for questions here, but so Brian, um, so what advice would you give someone that has lost their job or fear they may lose their job soon? Let's do that. Let's yeah, do that so, question. So first off, if you've lost your job, if you're fearing your job, if you've taken a furlough, a salary cut, all apologies in the world. Like, I'm so sorry. It's a terrible situation. And we're in one of the weirdest situations in the world. Um, I have cut my salary um, to conserve cash flow. A lot of businesses are looking at it in that light uh, of how do we make sure that we're conserving and we're holding on. And I tell you from everything in the bottom of my heart, um, it is one of the hardest times ever to be a CEO or be in charge of a company. And it is not a fun place to be. I, I take this very personally. I look at one of my jobs as helping the people. And even if it's just five other people who report to me um, as making sure that they can uh, provide for their families and eat and pay their rent and pay their bills. So um, we all um, are really trying and we're really in your corner. Now, that being said, if that does happen, um, there are a lot of resources out there for unemployment that um, pay pretty well now. Uh, I think the unemployment in the state of Florida is the equivalent of about a $46,000 a year salary, which is much better than the uh, past of what it was of about $275 a week, which really equates to very little overall. Um, and there's a lot of businesses that do come out of this time frame. And if you think that this is a time and you have something and you have a concept, there are a lot of resources that are out there. There's a lot of time that's out there. Don't sit around. Don't dwell. You can feel sorry for yourself for a couple of days. 
get in some good habits, get some exercise in, get, get, do what it is that you need to do to really get your mindset right and really be back in that focus into the positive of how do yeah. I push myself forward? How do I? No. Yep. Yep. Sorry, Brian. You, you wrote sorry. something here that I thought was interesting. Um, you said the second, um, Second point is that if you have an idea, a concept, you wanted to start a new business, now is the time to do it. Give it a shot. What yeah, do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Now is the time to be ready. So when money starts flowing, you are ahead of the game. Look, um, look how many businesses were born every session. So I think that's that's mm -hmm. pretty powerful inspiration. Yeah, it, it, it's you really do have nothing to lose. You're collecting basically free government money. Now it's not really free. Taxpayers are paying for it for you, and there's a two trillion dollar stimulus package that's helping you out, but you, this is an opportunity to really take that time and, and feel like you're forced into it where then you can then have that feeling inside that the only failing is yourself because you don't have a fallback plan. That, that's why a lot of side hustles end up failing is people will come up into a problem. They'll run into a roadblock and they'll say, well, I tried, didn't work out. I got my job anyway. It's fine. But if yeah. you, if you don't have that fallback plan, you really don't have anything to lose. You're not going to get fired from another job. You're not going to be spending too much time one place or the other. You probably need to focus on something mentally to keep yourself going. While there is a lot I'm going with homes and families, I'm spending a couple hours a day homeschooling my kids. Um, but they're really having that mentality of the nothing to lose. So you can push yourself forward. So you really cannot accept an excuse of failure you're going to be so much better prepared in three months, six months, when more people then are getting laid off or more people are on the line and struggling, or there are a lot of people looking for jobs all at one time. And then the businesses start to open up and there's a lot of problems going on in the world right now that businesses are going to be looking for people to solve. The reopening of this country or this world or this economy is one giant cluster of a problem. That <laughs> is, it really is. Um, it, it's, it's a big like a cluster of problem. Problems. I agree. Right? And so if you see a problem, you see a business. Mm -hmm. You see a problem, you see a business, right? And, that, and that's where the opportunistic people, that's how they look. And I'd be lying if I didn't say I wasn't looking at a couple of things and a couple of businesses. There we go. There we go, Brian. Uh, you've been outed, my man. You know I, what? I, yeah, I kind of have to. It's uh, um, not that I have to for me, but I have to because I see opportunities. And yep. for me, um, an opportunity missed is, uh, is just as much of a problem. Right. I mean, you, you conquered the synapse thing. You've done it two or three years in a row. Like, well, I, I'm not, that's not going anywhere. I'm still staying with that. I get it. But, it, but, but, um, you know, Brian's got more bullets in the gun than, than synapse. Hey, Cal, uh, I unlocked your microphone. Let's see if we can hear you this time. And by the way, Cal, we heard you, we had background noise on you earlier. That's why I turned it okay. off. So I know it works. I, oh, can you hear me this time? Yeah, there you are. Oh, beautiful. Okay, okay. Yeah, so thanks so much. Again, yeah. uh, I want to thank both uh, Alan and uh, my friend Brian for this tonight's show. Um, I just want to mention that I think Alan's show is the best antidote for this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank okay. you, Cal. Thank Tune you in. so much, man. Okay. <laughs> Every thank time. you so much. That said, man. I just want to let you know that I've become involved with something called the uh, Hack the Crisis, which is a global virtual hackathon to try and find solutions for this COVID-19. Uh, that just got completed but now what I would like to do is to do a, a local, meaning a Florida hackathon, call this the Sunshine State Hackathon. And if anybody's interested, please get in touch with me on my LinkedIn, just connect with me and we'd be happy, happy to share information with you. Okay? Hey, and hey, also Cal, thank 83 Cal, Degrees Media. Cal, reach out no. to me about that because we're talking internally at Synapse about potentially posing some challenges out there, uh, especially about, um, as we're calling it the renaissance of the economy or the resurrection of the economy and things starting to come back together. So maybe there's some partnership opportunities there as well. Okay. Hey, uh, real, so hey, thank you real so quick. Um, hey, Cal, what's that URL again? Okay. That URL is called globalhack.com. But uh, uh, I'll tell you what, here. No, no, no. A global hack. Just tell it to me. Global hack. With the globalhack.com. Do you want me to put it on with the- With a uh, T-H-E, with a T-H-E in front of it? Yeah, it's a T-H-E in the front. Okay, cool. And then I'm going to share. Here's the thing. I'm going to share. Hold on. I'm going to share my screen real quick, and we're going to. Everybody's going to. Um, everybody's going to see um, what that looks like. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. 
Cool, cool. There you go. So, so globalhack.com. Okay, so I'm gonna I think we can uh give me one second. Da, da, da. Oh, there it is. Hold on, I got it. The global hack right there. Allow. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, so you're bringing, just, me, bringing me up when you're talking about the global hack. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> I wonder. Can every can everybody see? Can everybody see my screen? There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. So I just wanted to pull that up and uh, and just let everybody see this site. And Cal, really quickly, three billion people in lockdown. Let's hack the future and never go through this again. The premise seems to be, you know, programmers, hackers unite to create products that will help the world become better when we come out of this. Is that a way to say it? Yes, absolutely. And also, I just want to mention, this is kind of like an online version of Synapse, except that this is global. Mm -hmm. And you got a prize pool of 195K euros? 195K euros? Well, very, very tiny, tiny contribution from me. Yeah. Yeah. So $195,000 of euros, but that's, that's about... Almost two hundred thousand dollars. That's over two hundred thousand U.S. dollars. And it's yeah. it's been divided over about 40, uh, 40 plus uh, winners. So okay. Cal, this is worldwide. This is internet. This is an international movement. Absolutely, indeed. Okay, mm-hmm. and really, yeah. this is a call to programmers, right? People that can write code. Yes, call, call okay. to programmers, designers, developers, and also marketing people because marketing is also quite important. Okay. Yeah. Good deal. So I'm glad to share Thank that. You. Um, Thank you so much. Very, very fantastic. Cal, I, I look forward to meeting up with you. We're across town from each other, but we're going to get it done soon, right? All okay. Right. I'll bring you some free food from my restaurant. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> we, hey, Cal, today's world, we all need, like, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting for, like, I've not sat down in a restaurant in two months. Like, the really good, great food um, would be amazing. Okay, so I want to throw, thank you for that, putting that, Cal, you put the link out there. Um, Anybody else have a question? So this is a guy in Brian Kornfeld that, um, you know, managed to pull off, uh, and you know, two epic quits from two major, major corporations, escaped Cubicle Nation, and um, and started his own, his own solopreneur, homepreneur business, building apps for folks and helping them do that with Popcorn Ventures. And and then just without realizing it, hustled and networked his way to Jeff Venick, the local billionaire of our city, and had the the gall to walk up to him and and connect with him on an issue that he was passionate about, that he cared about, which got him the meeting, and then ultimately ended up um, opening up door after door after door. So um, I want to see if anybody else has a question that they can throw out there from for Brian. And this is an open this is an open call. And I'm looking at the the list. I see a lot of vocal people out there. So I'm hoping somebody. By the way, if you don't feel like going on audio, just chat. Just throw it in the chat box, um, and we'll read it. I'll read it out loud. Or if you feel brave, let's go on. Let's go on the microphone. Who wants to challenge? Let me say this, Brian. Who wants to challenge Brian Ooh. in any of <laughs> in any of the things that? You know any of the strategies that he used to be successful, or anything that that I've said, or anything Brian has said, anything that anybody wants to challenge or when they want to reiterate. Um, we want to make this uh, conversation. We've got till we got another twenty minutes or so. We want to make we we actually want to help people. We want to discuss ideas. We want to challenge assumptions. We want to um, put wisdom out there. I mean, anything to stimulate this conversation is uh, is actually. Um, is actually welcome right now. And I see Chad, I see Chad is typing. Go ahead. I welcome a good challenge. I welcome a good conversation. Um, Just trying to to keep things moving forward and progressing. um, You know, people have the right entrepreneurial mindset when they are willing to be challenged and when they're willing to be, uh, to push in new ways and think about things from different angles and different perspectives versus someone who just says, nope, it's my way and that's it. Yeah. And by the way, Brian, Cal just threw up something. And while somebody else is brave enough to put a question or a challenge out, um, you threw something in your in your document to me that I want to call out. Um, you said there were two books that really came to mind for you if you were recommending someone. One, uh, why don't you talk about those two books? 
Yeah, and Cal kind of just touched on one uh, right there, the Lean Startup. Um, the Lean Startup to me, um, and while it's not a Bible. Um, Eric uh, Rice, uh, right? Eric Rice, yep, on, on how to exactly follow. But it's something that's so important. And so it's such a good tool to have and such a knowledgeable thing to have. Um, how to build something small. A lot of times, especially when the first time you're building something, you don't have the funding in it to really go full fledged, go all out. You don't have millions of dollars behind you. You don't have even a couple hundred thousand dollars behind you and you don't have an investment. You're trying to build something with just a couple of bucks from some friends and family that you've been able to scrounge together and with a, an idea, a concept, a product and a dream. And the Lean Startup helps teach you how to do things small, learn, measure, see what works. And then when it doesn't work, do it again and then do it again and do it again and go through these cycles and these really small but quick rapid prototype cycles that can really help you learn um, about your product and about your customers to help you great, create more sales. And that builds right into a bootstrap mentality that if you can do the two of those together where you're conserving, you're saving money, but you're building on the side um, and generating a, pro a revenue driving product right there, that's a, that's a direct recipe for success. And that can put you in multiple different buckets, whether you want to be one of those people who becomes a millionaire or you want to be one of those people who maybe then goes for something bigger further down the road. You give yourself all those opportunities for success versus um, if you do try uh, and swing for the fences right off the bat and say maybe somebody does give you half a million dollars and you spend 300,000 of it on, on development and you realize you've built this big monstrosity of a product, but something's wrong, you're going to be out of money like that. It, it's You don't even have multiple opportunities and multiple chances for success. So right. I, I'm big on that. And the other book, Made to Stick, um, and, and that's just something that really helps people um, keep it in their mind, keep that story, keep what the product is about. Storytelling is so important. It's such a such an important aspect of this world. Um, and, and being able to make something in that type of a way that people will remember that there's a story that goes along with it that can grow with them that can be a, become a part of them become a part of everyday life um, those are what uh, creates revolutionaries yep so those are two books we got a question those are two great books by the way i have both of those on my bookshelf um chad says what advice do you give to founders um on dedicating time and energy towards the founding agreements versus the working product do you think you can share some examples from what you've seen or lived through? So the founding agreements clearly are the arrangements between the founders. There's a great book called Slicing the Pie that you, you probably know about. In terms mm -hmm. of that, there's the founder agreements, which is kind of like the operating agreement, and, and there's other elements of that. And then there's the agreements with investors. But this whole idea of like putting your agreements together and putting energy into that, I'm, hell, I spent more money than I care to on one of my startups doing a PPM, which, oh my God, I couldn't believe the legal bill that I got at the end of that, um, versus um, working on your product. Yeah, if you and co-founder or co-founders are struggling mm -hmm. on coming up with an agreement on whether it's equity sharing or how much money you're putting in or something like that, imagine struggles down the road that you're gonna have with that co-founder and imagine how that team is gonna be built and how that's gonna work out together. And I've seen that very much firsthand where you know you come to an agreement and then um, one of the three people comes to the table and says, oh yeah, by the way, I don't want that agreement. You're gonna go with this and you're gonna like it or not. And I had one guy that I worked with where I had equity in the company as part of building the app and he wanted to rewrite the shareholders agreement and I wanted to write, um, a clause into it that said that we would be diluted equally in the event of taking on new um, new investors. And he said, I would rather uh, dissolve the company than write that agreement, write that line in there. And, and to me, that just, that said right there where the priorities were, all, all right there. And that's, um, that's tough. Like that, that's a really hard thing. It's a really hard thing to understand, but you have to be willing to, to go to war uh, for lack of a better term with your co-founders and when you're public facing and when you're outbound, you have to be willing to, to do everything together and to fully trust each other and know that each person is not doing it for the betterment of them, but for the betterment of the company as a whole. And if people are really that gonna be finicky, especially in a founding agreement, um, you have a lot more problems coming later on. There are some great ways to break it up. Uh, yeah, slicing the pie is a great way. 
that's a way to uh, help people understand and build equity based on the work that they put in versus just whatever they're putting in right off of the beginning. Some people have different ideas. Some people might have a different concept, but it really then turns into the sweat equity versus the money equity that's going in and creates a, a very fair way of doing it in the long run. Um, another, uh, There's a number of ways to do this. Uh, some people will go based on who's putting the money in. Some people go based on the IP, but it, to me, at least, getting that conversation going and getting to something near that you can agree on or negotiate on a little bit that's not painful um it, that should be one of the easiest things that you do especially super early on in a business because if your focus is not entirely on building and growing that business and it's more about what you're going to get out of it then it's destined for failure right absolutely i recommend that book slicing pie i've had so many of my my founders that i work with recommend that book and it's just a great way of trying to understand. There's there's tons of agreements out there that kind of organize and that are really geared towards investors and equity and founders. But there's so much ambiguity and fuzziness around co-founders in terms of tracking what equity is deserved by who based on effort. And that's just a great place to start slicing the pie. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron, I turned on your microphone, sir. And uh, let's hear your question or comment. Ron, are you out there? I turned on your mic. Let's there you. Let's see if you can. Let's see if you weigh in here. Um, by the way, I got a comment from Keith Long. Bill Ackman, me two billion by bad. Right. Okay, there, go. there you are. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Right. Go ahead. How you guys doing? Um, so, the reason why I said uh, I, I know the feeling or anything is because yeah, I'm like for example, right now I work from home as a uh, business analyst for Chase, and every every so often I would do that and then go to my own business and look and see how things are going. So no the feeling. Um, and I thank you guys for having something like this. Uh, my question is, is what, what, how do you like make that first step to gain that customer, to get that customer, right? Because in many cases, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they first start out, they have that fear of how do I approach someone to say, Hey, I've got this business over here and you need to come and check it out. So forth and so on. So what any advice in terms of, you know, making that jump? Yeah. Um, the biggest pieces of advice that I can give with this is one, understand your customer and listen to them. Just listen to them and then understand what's in it for them. If you can understand what's in it for them, then you can start to really tell that story and sell to that person about what it is that you are doing that is going to solve their problem and help them. The other thing on that is part of the storytelling. And one of the better books, I wish I would have put this in there actually as well, I read recently um, in the last year or two called My Story Brand. And it's all about branding yourself um, and your company in a story. And as you tell a story, and if you look at any movie, anything that you've ever seen, um, pretty much every movie follows the same exact script. Now it has different words and different characters, but there's a hero who has some type of a problem. Things are going well, but they have some type of a problem. It's an external problem, but they also have an internal problem that they have to overcome. They meet a guide, the guide gives them the plan. The plan then helps them um, achieve success and avoid failure. It's every single movie. Think about Top Gun, think about Star Wars, think about the Hunger Games. If you go on, you can just plug and play different characters and they all will fit that story. In the event of talking to someone and selling or trying to get a customer or branding and marketing, um, you are not the hero of the story. You are the guide. And the guide is trying to help the customer who is the hero because the customer thinks of themselves as the hero. And if you can help them feel like that hero, but your guide is going to um, and what you're doing, your product is going to help them achieve success and avoid failure, you're going to be put in a very positive position there. Yeah. Yeah. What I would add to that, uh, Ron, is just the idea of getting that first customer or just getting those early customers is really freaking hard. Right. Um, it's a lot harder than people realize. And uh, and, you know, this, Brian, from building up Synapse, like, you know, remember the first year and nobody cared and, you know, and nobody was signing up. And, and you know, yeah. it's like, yeah, I, it was scary. <laughs> and all of a sudden the last week happened. So holy crap. Um, yeah. Right. It, but it, it but is hard. It, and it's by the way, that hard. last week, that last week didn't just happen on its own. It was like you were it was a result of you like 
digging down deeper and deeper and pushing harder and connecting with more people and just being relentlessly, obsessively, maniacally, uh, paranoidly trying to find more and more people that would care. And, and that's the biggest message I would have for you, Ron, is, is uh, guess what? It doesn't come easy. Even that first customer doesn't come easy. Um, the five, the first five, 10, 15, guess what? It's, it's a slog. It's a slog. I don't care how great your product is, your services. Um, nobody cares. And, and, and the other thing on top of that, nobody cares. Is, is, right? is as you're going out and you're talking about it. And you need um, to tell yourself nobody cares. That's going to make you, that's going to push you to go push further through that. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Um, as you're going through this, um, and you try something a couple of times and it doesn't work, um, try something different. Don't, don't try the same thing. Don't tell the same story each time, write down, take notes, make sure you understand what you've done. Make sure you understand what didn't work. Maybe get a feeling for why it didn't work and keep making adjustments. Cause if you keep trying the same thing over and over and you expect different results, you're living the definition of insanity. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I just want to re rephrase that, 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 man, it's harder than anybody realizes. I just gave this talk to someone today, one of my uh, coaching clients I work with, like um, that whatever you, whatever you imagine that is going to come by way of uh, customers or interest or followers or whatever, um, whatever you <laughs> divide by like five or 10, uh, thousand. <laughs> Yeah, maybe by a thousand. It's so it's so frustrating and dis, and it's so dis demoralizing, right? Because you you've got a great product, you got a great message, everything's great, and like, where are the people? The bottom line is is that there is like escape velocity, right? You rocket scientists. By the way, we didn't touch enough on the rocket scientist that's on the call with us here, right, Brian? But 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 getting escape velocity and it's like I don't care how great your rocket is. But if you can't get escape velocity, you're a zero. Yep. It's a zero. It's a zero, right? So yep. I hate to say it that way, but unfortunately, you, you your rocket your rocket can be great, and your product can be great, your service everything can be great. But if you can't put enough fuel in that tank to get through and penetrate and break through, then you will fall back to earth, and it'll be really sad that something really well built and well intentioned couldn't get there. And, um, and so many businesses deal with this, Brian, right? Where it's not a function of how great their product or service or their team is. It's a, a matter of grit, tenacity, and determination. And are they willing to like double down and triple down and just obsess? I wish, Brian, I wish I could have been, I wish I could have put a camera on you in the six months leading up to your first synapse. Or even <laughs> the last three, yeah, the last three months. Wow. I wish I could have put a camera on you. I bet you were just i already know you enough to know this you were just probably like impossible to talk to impossible to keep your attention on anything you probably uh -oh. were the worst friend and the worst husband and the worst like it was probably terrible because you knew that you were getting ready to score a zero you knew you were getting ready to throw up a a a, 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 a null and it just must have haunted the shit out of you if you knew i could go through the story of how we locked down our biggest uh, not our biggest keynote, but the CEO of Hyperloop who came in and talked to us. It came from a connection we had who connected us to a guy named James Nakagawa who lives in Tokyo. I'm on the phone with this guy in Tokyo trying to see if he knows all these people. He's connecting me to people all over the world about conferences and he connects me to this guy, Dirk. And so somehow I get on a conference call with James in Japan, Dirk who's in Germany. And oh, by the way, I'm on vacation with my in-laws at a house in Jamaica um, maybe four or five weeks out. It was a pre-planned vacation, something that we, we had planned to do and spent pretty much three quarters of this vacation on my laptop working, unfortunately. I wish I could have enjoyed that one a little bit more. Um, but having this literal gl global conference with sweat, call, with four sweat, to beads, beads. sweat beads on your forehead. <laughs> and, and a red stripe on the table. I'll, I'll be honest there. But um, just, and that's that's what it is. And, th and that's what we do. Um I didn't want, um, before going too far, I, we did get another question that came in. Um, Keith asked about uh, what post-coronavirus economy looks like for startups uh, in Florida, which yeah. is a really good one. Um, because um, uh, one of the things about Florida is it's a very business-friendly state. And when you look at other markets, um, people are really pushing 
on cutting costs right now. And if you're going to cut costs, one of the things that you can do is work and build and grow companies in a state that is very business friendly. And, and I can see us getting a lot of good attention from outside investors coming very soon. If you look, though, at the way Silicon Valley has responded to this, they've kicked it into another gear. They see this as, a OK, here's my opportunity to really go faster um, while cutting well, some costs. And yeah. if we can do that as a state and we can continue to build on ourselves as a state in that way, um, opportunities really are endless. And I, I know that's kind of cliche to say, but they really are. And we just all have to think about it together because if one or two stand out, um, it might not work. But if we have that herd mentality that we're all going to do this successfully, um, we got a lot of great chances ahead of us. Absolutely. We, we know this. The the you know, it's interesting, the um, the wealthy mindset, people of wealth, you know, the rich get richer. We know this, right? And this is how they do it. You buy low, you sell high, you buy low and you hold, whatever, right? And uh, and now, now, and so if you don't have wealth or money and you can't buy things and so forth, what you can do is you can invest in yourself right now. Uh, you can invest in yourself and you can use this time to like dig your well before you're thirsty and really... Um, do those things that you always said that you would do that you never got serious about doing, whether it be the fact that you have more time at home or just by the fact of just like the scariness of the fact that you don't really control your destiny, right? So you, if you don't have money to invest and you're not of the wealthy set, investing in yourself right now is like the smartest thing you can do. And by the way, there's no immediate, there's no immediate results. There's no instant gratification. Nothing comes your way. Everything you do when you invest in yourself, this is like investment. When you buy a property, you don't get any reward off a of property. Anytime you buy a company, there's no people, the investor mindset, people don't realize there's no near term reward for investors. Matter of fact, most of the investors that invest in early stage tech companies have to wait five to eight years before they get a return. There's no near term. You have to look at yourself the same way. You have to invest in yourself, whether whatever skill you're going to develop or whatever plan or business or whatever you're working on, or even a certification or a degree, whatever it is, you have to look at it and go, hey, I'm going to take this opportunity while things are down. And I'm going to invest in myself, knowing that there will be no there will be no gratification for years, and yep. um, you got to look at it that way. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I know a lot of people who are doing it. A lot of people are going to a coding school. You can use the free coding academies like Launch Code Academy. There's people who are taking online courses. It's uh, one of my team members who's taking some time. She's uh, learning project management. So continually level yourself up and continue to learn these new skills, read a new book, how to manage yeah. a business, how to start a business. Um, there's anything positive and progressive will help you out down the road. That's right. Keith has a question. Connections with business relationships have been disruptive, uh, has been disrupted, stunted even, I would even throw in there. What to do? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm going to throw out a first quick, quick response. Um, the Even though there's a lot of spamming going on with LinkedIn right now, uh, for sure. Uh, there's still opportunity. I'm just going to throw it out. There's still opportunity on LinkedIn um, to connect with people if you do it in the right way and you do it in an authentic, authentic way and a very, uh, uh, you can reach out and you can connect with people. So I just want to throw that out there by way of connections and business relationships. This might be your, your, this might be your LinkedIn opportunity, right? Because let's be real. Most of us are in jobs. We get a lot of LinkedIn requests. We ignore them and blah, blah, blah. We're busy. We don't get around. We don't really treat our LinkedIn very, very well. We treat our, you know, a lot of people treat their Facebook better than LinkedIn, but like right now, um, you know, there, this is, I think this is an opportunity to make a lot of new connections, by the way, just connecting with somebody, just connect. That's not a lot of value. Um, but to actually, um, connect via, um, you know, writing them a message, but, but can't be spammy. Can't be anything you're asking for yourself. It has to be, Hey, I'm a fan of what you're doing. Just want to let you know that that's something is that simple. Yeah. I, uh, I'll, anyway, that's my first reaction. I, I, wholeheartedly agree with that. And I also think that there's a lot of people out there right now who have more time that would be willing to take that half an hour phone call because they don't have to drive from meeting to meeting right now. So yeah. if you really do want to connect with someone, you do really want to reach out, you want to learn about them, you want to see how you can help them out, see what you can do. Now's not a bad time. Um, it's the people who do the opposite of what's going on in the world are the ones who usually end up being a little bit successful. So if yeah. you, if yeah. people are slowing down, that's the time to speed up. 
people are speeding up, that's the time to kind of slow down and, and let the fast people bump into each other and wreck into each other and wait in the weeds. And, and now is the time to actually speed up with some of those connections and get in on the ground floor of people learning this new normal of working remotely. Yeah, I would add to that, like, there's no better time in the world I can think of where people are actually at home, they're responding, like, again, back to LinkedIn and other platforms that you might have, social media. But again, it's so important that you reach out um, from, from a position of how can I support and help you? I'm a, I'm a fan of what you're doing. How can I support and help? And um, that's really the only formula that works. Don't, don't try to ask for something. Don't try to sell something. And um, because, uh, you know, yeah. I know all the time, if, if somebody reaches out to me on LinkedIn, I don't know who they are, and I click yes to connect with them, and all of a sudden I get a message, oh my God, you should do my software, I'm a financial analyst, whatever it might be, I'm never gonna pay attention to that person ever again. If someone reaches out and they say, hey, I'd love to connect, with lo and somebody says, hey, I'd love to learn more about you, I, I just, I, I really wanna learn more about you, or I really wanna help out, I love the cause that you're doing, that's how people have gotten jobs. That's how we found volunteers. That's how we, we've we supported people. We've helped them. It's always people who come and they ask for something. Um, I, I tend to say, I heard a, an investor, Steve McDonald, actually say this last year. When people come to me and they ask me for an investment, they end up getting advice. When they come and ask me for advice, they end up getting an investment. And so that's uh, a little bit of the way this goes, maybe not in the investment world, but when you go and you ask how you can help someone, you might get helped out in return. When you go yep. and you ask for them to help you, you're probably That's getting right. Them. That's right. It's just so simple and it, it takes discipline. It takes it takes uh, discipline and uh, um, a vision for where you're trying to go. So before we, we've got about four minutes before we wrap up and uh, we got one question here uh, more on from Keith. And I would encourage anybody who wants to sneak a question in at the last minute, please raise your hand or throw it in the chat box. But, but Keith says, how about reducing prices? So obviously there's this, the obvious, you know, take on that is um, there's a tendency to want to reduce, obviously reduce prices because people are you. You want to try to capture customers because they're 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 under financial pressure themselves, or you know, there's a clamoring for business, a clamoring for anybody's got nickels left, anybody's got nickels left to spend. Let me lower my price to capture that, right? And um, I don't. Um, I don't normally subscribe to that and it, it's obviously available. I don't, I don't really disavow it either. Like I don't judge people that do draw up their prices right now, but, but, but I, I would say um, just to be very cautious and careful about that because um, your value is what you, what people pay for you is what, what the perceived value is. Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's really no blanket answer of yes, it's right or no, it's not right. Um, one thing that we learned, uh, especially this year, and I'll use this as a prime synapse example, is for ticket sales. And we did uh, for the 2019 event, we had a er, super early bird set of tickets, an early bird set of tickets, regular price tickets. And then we decided we were going to do all these promos and specials towards the end when we really wanted to push ticket sales. Then this year, everybody was waiting for the promos but we weren't gonna do them. We intentionally said, no, we're not gonna do them. We even announced on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, this is our last promos, but people were waiting because what you then have said is that's the actual value and that's what you can charge and people know that you can then charge that. And so if you can charge that little, then you're setting yourself up for some issues in the long that's run. The true, that's the true price. Yeah, and so there is a little bit of that, but then there also is the, we do need to maintain some semblance of a business here and maintain something going. Uh, I really think it depends on your situation. It depends on your business. It depends on everything that go that's going on around you before there's a, this is the right way or this is the right way. So, so absolutely. And so this is what I recommend on that. And I think, you know, Eric, you made a good point here. Pro huge proponent of not taking a cut. And somebody, and Keith said, you know, I'd rather be busy at a lower rate than prospecting in that time. Um, I'm thinking you will get your first time. So here's the thing. Um, you, I was, this, my only caveat to that is, um, tr if you lower your price, make sure you're getting something in return. In other words, like in asking a prospect or customer up front that they will in fact review and, and put a review in on you or post about you on social media or something, whatever a value that's of non-financial, right? Make sure that 
that you can get some, uh, hey, I'm going to lower my price. I'm going to do this for less, but and but I need your support in helping me in this different way, right? So being a testimonial, uh, putting social media support for you or reviews or 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 maybe just anything else that would like counterbalance the value, but by all means, under no circumstances, to Eric's point on this, Eric Lederman's point, just inadvertently lowering your price without getting something in return. Uh, that that's the best way I would say about that because ultimately you're right. Lowering value, lowering the price point can get trigger business, but people you want to make sure that they feel like they're getting like this reduction. They got to be excited about this reduction, and they all they have to do is do a couple things for you. Let them. What are those couple things? Let them do a couple things for you to get this reduction, and then they feel great about it. But then you get these intangible, non-monetary benefits that can come from it, right? Um, and I'm going to say your yeah, there, there's, price. There's yeah. definitely a couple things. A first-time customer, if you you go with the Sirius XM method. First and by the way, months, Brian, real quick, you could get people testimony like the Synapse Conference. You love testimonials for that, right? So like make oh, people, yeah, we, we, make we people earn, earn make people earn earn those, this year. Yeah, earn those discounts, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, at, yeah, the first time customer thing, um, I think the question had come out or the suggestion had come out. Definitely one way to do it. Get people locked in now, but make sure they also understand what they're getting into later. Um, like Sirius XM, they'll always give you a three month trial. America Online always would mail you a free CD in the mail. But you knew, you know, if you get Sirius XM in three months, they're charging you 20 bucks a month and they can do that. And so you have that opportunity where you can think through um, how to get somebody in your door, especially if they're gonna be a repeat customer, if you have something who you can keep on the line, you're getting money month over month, um, but set expectations correctly that saying like, I can only do this for this period of time, like I can't, it can't be a forever thing. Hey Brian, in case we get cut off on Facebook Live, I wanna thank you for being on my show. Thank you for being a great uh, leader in our community and just helping people with so many great advice. We're gonna stick around a few more minutes, but I think this Facebook Live is set up for like 8.30 hard stop. And I just wanna make sure I thanked you for that. So uh, thank, thank you, Facebook. Thanks Alan for having me uh, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Till, next, till next time, right? Seriously, I'm always happy to do this. You know me. <laughs> we love to talk about this stuff, don't we? Yep. Um, and by the way, so I just want to put that out there in case we get cut off. Um, and then thank you, Keith, for for a comp He's like saying we had a great conversation. We're working hard here, Keith. You can see that it's this is not easy as as we make it look. <laughs> we have to show up. We have to get good lighting, and we have to have our you know our A game on, right? If only you all had a camera following me around the house trying to find the right lighting. I'm, Alan's going to go on Amazon after this. I was this like, I need, I was like Brian, lighting. I need more I need more lighting. I need more lighting. Keep moving. Um, so, by the way, uh, uh, Q says the price signals quality of your service. Thank you, Q. Q, by the way, is going to be a future guest of mine with Olga. And I'm excited to meet these ladies because they they actually intrigue me quite a bit. I'm, they're mysterious to me, so I can't wait to learn more about them. Um, and uh, thank you, Q, for sticking around to the end. Wow, that tells me that maybe we were doing something right. And then Art says, I have, I have done BOGOs before at my full price. Margin is big enough to do that sort of thing. So, okay, cool. So Art saying basically um, put your full, you know, go with your full price, BOGO or discount, but basically your discount becomes your, the price that you really were happy with to begin with, right? So another tactic is to is to put that regular list price out there pretty high. So then you have a perceived discount, a perceived discount. Yep. There, there's a million ways to to do this. Um, there's well, the, no beautiful, right the, the big, but the big takeaway is that you didn't really, you're not really. Don't ever give away nothing for nothing. Don't give away something for nothing, I think is the big takeaway. Either your discount is not a real one or you're getting something. I like the idea of, of getting something from the from the customer that can help balance that out. Yep, agreed. 100% yeah. agreed. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Okay, guys, I think we're going to – okay, Keith's got a little bit of, a, of an ad here before we wrap up. Um, Q, I can't believe you went this whole thing, Q. And, uh, and all I got was that, that you went the whole way, which by the way, really makes me happy. But then you had this one thing at the end. I'm learning a lot about, her name is Q, by the way. It's a pretty cool nickname. I'm learning a lot about her uh, personality because I'm like, she stuck around. And then at the very end, there's this amazing comment at the end. Um, so uh, 
at the end here, um, Keith, uh, you filter your customers into those with the lower prices and those that I can't, right? So by the way, Keith, there's a reality to this, right? So don't let us get high and mighty on our high horse about pricing and so forth. You know, we have to engage our customers and prospects the best we can. And, and sometimes you do have to do things to stay in business and to keep things flowing. And frankly, there's a lot of long time value, long term value in prospects and customers. Even if you do it for less, they ultimately will give you referrals and testimonials and things like that. Whether you get it up front, whether you get that agreement up front or not, there's a lot of value in just staying busy and keeping customers flowing. So don't get me wrong. It's just something you want to resist. I have a, of a sales trainer that used to help me with my negotiation that says you need to, you need to um, show struggle through your negotiation. Like, don't make it easy to lower that. Like, uh, you know, like, uh, okay, um, yeah, let there, me. There, there's a reason the car salesman goes in the back for 10 minutes and says, <laughs> oh, I got to talk to my manager about that. Right, 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 right. They you know, know show, show know. that struggle. Make them feel your struggle, and frankly, I hate to say it, but they will feel compelled to like help help you know square the situation. And then that's when you you should ask for things that are non monetary. Like think of all the things you could get. Think of all the endorsements and referrals and testimonials, and think of all the stuff that you could ask for when you are uh, lowering your prices. Yep. Okay. All right, guys. Um, Okay. Hey, Eric, man, you were late. I think Eric just got started. I mean, Eric, a lot of folks jumping in now. I feel like I sh we shouldn't be cutting it off, but I'm thinking, well, you know what? Uh, Brian and I go to bed at uh, 8, 45, 10 till nine every night. Like we're, we're, you know, <laughs> early, right? <laughs> Brian, are you an early to bed, early to rise? Cause I am for sure. Um, I, I'm usually bed around 10 30, wake up 6 30. Um, try to get those eight hours in. That's pretty. That's pretty early to bed, early to rise. I think not as yeah. me, not as much as me, but that's still mo pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I try. I, I do my best. I actually, I love being the first one in the office in the morning um, or online nowadays because I can get so much more done and get well yeah. ahead. And that's one yeah. of the ways that I can stay so efficient is because I'm always yeah. ahead of the game versus trying to play catch up all the time. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm, 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 I got it from my dad. I'm a complete beast in the morning. I like, I'm a, I'm in beast mode. Like I'm, I wake up in beast mode. I'm, I'm like a, I'm a machine from, from 5 AM to 10 AM. And, and yep. after that, I just kind of start trickling downhill and then, you which know, explains then why, to, uh, explains the end of the call at 8 30 PM. Yeah, exactly. But I, uh, you know, I try I get a second win after five. So there you go. But don't yeah. even try to be, don't try to get anything productive out of me between noon and five. That's well, Brian, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait for next time. And uh, we're going to get you better lighting, lighting and a better camera. We're going to get you more high definition because I don't think people can appreciate like the full Brian. <laughs> for people who really want to appreciate what I have gone through. This, <laughs> this has been in your face the whole time, right? Yeah. Um, just, just to try to get decent lighting for this call. So <laughs> I'm going to Amazon and I'm ordering a ring light. Uh, it's fantastic. Tomorrow. It's fantastic. Um, all right. Thanks again, Brian. It was a pleasure. And uh, everybody, we're signing off. And uh, oh, wait, Eric, Eric Lederman's a 1 a.m. guy. There's these, there's night owls out there. They do their best work at night. Okay, great. We're all different. And um, Ronald, wait a minute. What's Ron? Are you a morning or a night person? I can't cut it off when I got somebody typing. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for the thank you. Until next week, Thursday thank night, you. we have Cole Robinson. I've got another kick ass entrepreneur on Thursday night. Thank you, everybody, for your support. And um, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.